Welcome to this session. This is the final day of the conference, and this session is called Rebugging the Planet. It's a conversation uh, between, I think, two extraordinary women, bug lovers, self-declared. Is that okay to call you guys that? I hope it, hope it is. Um, yeah, a conversation with two bug lovers on ways to help our invertebrates. Um, so bug being used in its loosest um, sense. Now, um, my name is Gillian Burke. I'll introduce myself first. Um, I'm going to be hosting the session. I, you know, hopefully just guiding the conversation, fielding um, questions from the audience. Um, the session was billed as uh, an opportunity to ask lots of questions. We've got an hour and a half, so there should be the opportunity to do plenty of that. Um, there is a chat. So as you're joining, welcome, introduce yourselves, let us know who you are, where you are in the world. Um, that's a really good reminder as well for, for all of us that this is um, a really, really international conference. Um, despite being called the Oxford Real Farming Conference, it is truly one of the most sort of international and actually diverse um, events that I've ever had the opportunity to attend. So it's been really exciting for that reason. So yeah, introduce yourselves, where you are in the world, who you represent or not, organizations. Um, any info about you is welcome. It's just nice to know who's there. It's great to be able to do these conferences and these sessions virtually online. It means that actually we can reach more people, but I don't know about you, I'm a bit old school. I do miss the in-person face-to-face as well. So yeah, the, you know, the next best thing is to let us know who you are so we, we get a feel for who's in the audience. I know that the audiences have been quite, quite diverse in terms of backgrounds, lots of farmers, as you'd expect, but people from NGOs, and also just people who are interested, members of the public who are interested in, in finding ways to, I guess, heal this relationship of how we, how we exist on this planet, how we feed ourselves, and, and what that all means for all the other non-human life that we share the planet with. So um, just to introduce our speakers for the next hour and a half, um, some of you may have seen Sally Ann Spence yesterday. Um, I'll introduce her again, nevertheless. Sally Ann Spence is a fellow of both the Royal Entomological Society and also the Linnaean Society, an honorary associate at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. Her specialty, which she spoke a lot about yesterday, was is dung beetles and pasture land and this biodiversity. She founded the UK Dung Beetle Mapping Project, which is a way, as it would suggest, of accumulating a lot of data information of where dung beetles exist, how they use different habitats, and obviously, particularly in arable and farmland, agricultural land. Um, Sally Ann Spence has got an enormous amount of practical experience. I'm looking forward to asking some of the questions about how you got into this at all in the first place, but um, is a founding member of Dung Beetles for Farmers, which I suspect is, um, well, I hope is gonna be where a lot of questions come from today. Um, so she runs that group to raise awareness, um, but also to highlight the con conservation needs for dung beetles specifically, but obviously that will, that will reach to other invertebrates, other insects as well. Um, so a passionate advocate for British farming and biodiversity, and also does a lot of scientific um, public outreach work um, at farms, at various events and media platforms, much like this one today, and including TV work as well. Um, Sally Ann, I know you said that you've um, spent 25 years getting dung beetles recognized in the UK. I'm sure we'll be looking forward to hearing more about that story as well. And then just to introduce our second speaker for this session, this is Vicky Hurd, who is head of sustainable farming campaign for Sustain, um, the Alliance for Better Food and Farming. And this is an alliance of over 100 non-profit non organizations, all working for better farming, for environment supply chain and policy um, related policies as well. She is a published author, runs an independent consultancy, um, has over 30 years of experience in food and farming and environmental policy, um, working both nationally here in the UK, but also in the, in the EU and international as well. And then she's an advisor on several boards, including a trustee for Pesticides Action Network, um, also TV production companies, Keo Films, um, and is chair of Eating Better Alliance. 
Vicky has also recently published a book. This is by Chelsea Green Publishing. I'm going to hold it up here. Rebugging, that's probably the wrong way around, isn't it? Oh, it's a mirror image, but I'm sure everyone can figure that out. That says Rebugging the Planet. That is the name of the talk today, the session. Um, so I thought maybe that'd be a nice chance, Vicky, for you to jump in mm -hmm. and just explain a little bit about the title, about this word and what you hope it will achieve. Thank you so much, Gillian. And um, thank you for your forward to the book, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah, the, the idea of rebugging actually came to me. I think I was sitting on a, a, tr a train um, and I'd heard a lot of, um, this was about two years ago, um, the data, particularly come from Germany, but from around the world about crashes in um, invertebrate, particularly insect um, uh, numbers and diversity as well. So um, the abundance of insects was declining, being seen over long-term spans. Um, but I'd also been looking at this new book called Rebirding, um, which is just my brain, I, I've got to the age where I can't remember names. But the author <laughs> has written this wonderful book about rebirding, about rewilding and, and relation it to the bird communities that are so critical um, to rewilding and it could be boosted by rewilding projects across the UK. And um, I thought, well, if we can talk about rebirding, why not rebugging? It immediately came to me, you know, we, and, it, and it sort of rolls off the tongue um, because we can all rebug. Um, we can all be part of the rebugging and therefore the rewilding um, initiative, which is so inspiring, you know, getting people to think about the wild things on their doorsteps, as well as in um, large estates or on farms. A lot of farms do a lot of rewilding already around or in their fields. And uh, yet that can be quite separate from people in urban areas, towns and cities. And yet we've all, we all come across wild things every day when we step out of our door and even actually just when we step out of bed you've got your your wasp nests in your roof and your spiders all potentially useful insects some of which you know worry people but they're wild things everywhere so the idea was uh, but they were in trouble and so um you know and i've watched um programs like spring um spring watch um really increase people's understanding of interest you know everybody in the country is, has got more understanding of the role of invertebrates as a result of these kind of programs. And so we can build on that and get them to understand they can actually do something. And so rebugging was an idea. You can rebug your home, you can rebug your garden, you can rebug your school, your workplace, um, and your food and your purchasing, your clothes. So rebugging works with all parts, of, you know, every part of your life, you can do a bit of rebugging and even your politics, which we could probably go on to at some point, but uh, it's an important part of it, but uh, with a small p. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of where it came from, but I slightly stole it as all the best ideas are often stolen from a brilliant author who did rebirding. <laughs> Who's uh, Benedict McDonald, uh, by That's the way. It. Thank yeah. you. Yes. I've got you know no, no head for the name. Vicky, I also had a blank. I actually had to just Google that. I'm sorry, oh, okay. everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. But there we go. Thanks so much, Vicky. Um, absolutely. You know, I. Um, I did enjoy the book. I, I wrote the foreword for it. And th thank you for asking me to, because that's always, a, you know, quite an honor to do. And I think for me, what was really interesting about the book was the, um, just how far reaching it was, you know, everything from activities, things you can do with your kids to um, policy, you know, lobbying your MP, grassroots campaigning, and also even, you know, taking on the big multinationals as well, which I know there may be opportunities to talk about all of that um, in the next hour and a half. But if I'm honest, like one of the things that I, I mean, I, I'm self-proclaimed, you know, I, I love what I call the, the spineless, the spineless wonders of the world, the invertebrates, the, the, the creatures that I think are sort of, especially as someone who works in TV and, and, and presenting on these subjects, I like the challenge of trying to get people engaged with the, 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 the creatures that I guess people would love to hate or the creepy crawlies of the world. Um, I, I like that challenge. They're the, the underdogs of the natural world. Yeah. Um, my my connection with i guess the invertebrate world really was just from growing up in kenya um in the sort of late 70s and 80s when there was no devices no daytime telly we were talking about that earlier mm. and and playing was outdoors and even indoors i mean it was very difficult not to notice that you know these creatures all share the planet with us um so that was my engagement with it and i think almost 
because of that, I tend not to think of insects and all the associated vertebrates as kind of, well, why do we need them? How can they help us? I'm like, well, they surely they just need to be there. Yeah. And I suspect, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, that maybe that sort of underpins a lot of the, the ability to, mm. especially for you, San Leanne, I know you said 25 years of trying to, you know, raise, you know, raise the flag mm-hmm. for dung beetles. What got you into, into this subject area? Well, I think I had one of the last feral childhoods, really, where <laughs> where I went out the back door and I disappeared for the day. And my parents, I'm sure they had some level of concern, but, you know, it wasn't it wasn't quite the thing. You know, I, I grew up on a farm in, in Suffolk, um, quite sort of away from everybody else. And I just went off and played all day uh, up in the woods, in the ditches, even on the muck heap. Um, anywhere I could get to, I would explore. And I was a child and children are very much into their their bugs. Um, and I never grew out of it. Um, I have the same excitement now. Uh, if I go into a field and, and get down on my knees and have a look at in the undergrowth and the grass and everything, and I find even something, you know, just a pill millipede, I'm absolutely delighted. I'm thrilled. I'll pick it up and I want to see it roll up and I want to share that excitement, really. So it's, it's, it is that sort of, you know, that, that base sort of thing. And then you know, I've noticed a decline in insects um, and that, that, that's without even sort of studying it. You know, there was this there is from what I experienced as a child to what I experienced now as a decline on not only the insects, but everything that feeds on them as well. Um, and that's what got me into the data collecting really was was that baseline data, because you don't know what you're losing till you know what you've got. And with dung beetles in particular, they live in dung. They're not pretty like the butterflies. And, you know, they didn't have the collectors and things they, a lot of the other groups did. Um, mainly because they, they live in dung and they're just not noticed. Dung is there one minute and it's gone the next. And that's what happens. Mm-hmm. Um, so growing up on a farm, you know, that, that, that interest in insects. And I had this sort of natural sort of interest in insects that, that are a part of a healthy farming system. So mm. dung beetles fell in. And then the minute you start looking at dung beetles, it's hard not to fall in love with them, quite mm. frankly. They are just yeah. gorgeous insects. So that's that's me in a nutshell, really. Just that captivated me. I, I, I'm hugely interested in all insects right across the board. Yeah. Um, but, but working with insects within the farming community has been a bit of a cooling because I'm within that community as well. So mm. I, I can do a little bit more on the practical front. I can actually make small changes that become big changes that are actually saving species from local extinction and things like that. So it's, it's because you know I have that connection. I'm sat here now in my house, which I've converted into a laboratory. So I've got farmers coming on a farm mm. and talking with me and yeah. But no, the, the, so the, for me, the, the interest is just simply from that childhood fascination. And it, it just didn't stop. In fact, it grew. And um, yeah, that's, that's really the background to me on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just looking you know, through the chat at the moment. There's um, some lovely comments, um, particularly lots of comments about rotting wood. I'm sure we can get into that yeah. as well. Um, but, you know, people mentioning sort of um, Sally Ann, um, how you've managed to get people interested in dung beetles and helping to identify them. So I know we will um, get into more of that. I just wanted to, again, just encourage people. There is a Q&A function um, to, to post any questions directly for Vicky and Sally Ann, which we will pick up and you know try and answer as many as possible. Um, Vicky, I just wanted to ask you in terms of writing the book, I I mentioned that it had, it covers a lot of ground Mm. and you start to see that there's so many, what I call sort of access points, touch points for people to get involved with rebugging the planet, or in other words, you know, sort of a, just Mm. feeling that sense of wonderment, but also Mm. the idea of, well, you know, how do we how do we encourage practices, lifestyles, you know, habits, yeah. whatever, to yeah. to a, you know, bring, you know, boost these numbers back, both both you know, individual and biodiversity numbers, but also, is it? I mean, was it? Is it a challenge? Because most people don't really see um, having insects and vertebrates in their vicinity as something that is welcome. Yeah. They're often thought of as pests. Yeah. Well, you know, what's the challenge been for you? Yeah, I think, I mean, that was the interesting thing. I, just an anecdote, a lot of people have said, as I've done talks since the um, book came out, um, in relation to what Sally was saying, you used to be able to, when you drove through the countryside or drove anywhere, you'd get a splattering 
of insects on your windscreen and on your lights and you'd have to clear it off at the end and in the UK we don't really get that now most most places you don't get that and quite a few people of a certain age have mentioned that to me and and the subtitle my original subtitle for the book was um it was rebugging the planet or how to get the insects back on your windscreen and the um uh, publishers uh, decided to scrap that subtitle quite rightly but because younger people wouldn't actually get it it wouldn't make sense because they've never seen that a lot of people haven't seen that and that's just an anecdotal expression of the trends that that people do have recognized when they when they used to it but it was it was quite funny we we ended up with a rather long title but I quite like it subtitle but I quite like it but I think one of the other things that um, was good about writing the book was thinking about our attitudes and changing our attitudes to invertebrates um, in general and why have they changed why have we got so hostile to, to all invertebrates because there are a few that are a nuisance and you know in some parts of the world they're more than a nuisance you know they there needs to be controls there needs to be protection for people who are at risk from diseases or from buildings that termites are so amazingly brilliant at uh, destroying um but that's a tiny percentage and particularly in the uk there's a very few that cause any harm and we need to have a rebugging of our attitudes so there is a chapter in the book about rebugging our attitudes and 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 thinking about how you can do that and one of the ways I talk about is often with the children that you might have or you're caring for um, thinking about having a different response when you see insects or worms um, I my son came in when he was I think very very little toddler with a handful of dirty worms and I was so thrilled that he'd dug them up from the from the garden and, and come into the kitchen with them um, and with his mate I think and uh, and I was thrilled and I you know I was talking about them and I, I talk about that in the book and about how instead of saying oh that's dirty or don't go near that that um, what wasp for instance because it'll sting you or that bee trying to curb that in instinct to say that with children and instead change your attitude to say well those bees are amazing because they're going to make give us food because they're pollinating the crops or the beautiful flowers around us or those worms they create the soil that we're walking on every day and they're doing amazing things so it's about rebugging the attitude um uh of everybody but particularly focusing on the and the the coming generations which are going to have a big challenges we've got climate change and nature emergencies that are with us now many parts of the world they're really with us people are dying as a result of these things so we have to protect the, the natural life systems on which we depend um, the water the soil our food our you know trees all of these we can't do without um, we really can't there's a few people think we can grow all our food in vats but I don't subscribe to that. I think our food should come from the soil and our clothes and our furniture. And that all absolutely depends on invertebrates from a whole range of invertebrates. You know, it's not just the bees, which are iconic and, and thankfully, thankfully well loved, I think. Um, but getting people to change their attitude and, and get a bit of understanding. So I've got a lot of boxes in the book in the book with the examples of bugs and then there are other boxes which are tips you can do and tips even if you only have um uh, you know if you have very little time there are tips for if you have very little time and actually some tips you can save time leaving your garden to, to a bit of your garden to go wild can mean you don't you know save time with um with, with any chemicals certainly or with mowing you know having a no mow may and things like that um that's that's all and then you if you want to get a bit more involved there's tips about getting a bit more time um, commitment and then there's big ones so you know it's it's something everybody can do to help help the um, invertebrates in their lives and around their homes and in their parks and in their food and far and the farming that they interact with because everybody eats so yeah it's it's uh, it's changed I, I think rebugging your attitudes it's funny how much that chapter has come up most in the talks and podcasts I've done um, mm -hmm. and I think that's great because it's you know that's what we need to do everybody needs to think differently about bugs so few are a problem um mm. and uh you know we don't automatically also have to reach for the chemicals i talk about the ways you can keep bugs out of your house if you really don't want them in your house and a lot of them in your house can be really useful i mean um spiders can be amazing fly trappers if you don't want flies you know look after your spiders um but if you don't want them there's non-chemical ways you can keep them out when I, I did a master's in pest management and one of the first things you learn is is about uh, removing the entry points 
and removing the food sources and and that's you know that's very physical things they're not chemical you don't have to have chemicals and uh, think about your house or your your um, garage or your kitchen in that way rather than reaching for the bottle mm -hmm. sorry that was a slightly <laughs> long-winded answer but no, it, it's, right all, it's yeah. all good stuff and I think I think there's um that's definitely resonating mm. you know I'm looking through the chat mm. I definitely, you know can see that people get that you know this this goes beyond a sort of few activities that yes. you know this is a mindset mm. um change mm. shift exactly. and I think you know even this idea that well you're right everybody eats we all do you know that, you know all the tech, whatever it is, we're still living, breathing organisms that need to eat. Mm. Um, and, you know, hopefully the, the, the title of this whole event, Real Farming for Real Food, um, yeah. I, I subscribe to that as well. Mm. Um, I mean, I would say that my experience, particularly in Kenya, where you were describing where um, you, you just learn to live alongside, you know, things that aren't necessarily welcome in the home. So ants, you know, you just drop a few grains of sugar and there will be ants yes. on that before yes. you, you can mm. blink. So mm. you learn to sort of make sure you, you don't leave mm. food out. You don't leave spillages for, mm. for any length of time because, you know, it will take minutes for that to be found. And then you've got, you know, a trail of ants coming in through, you know, a window or whatever, a gap in the mm. door. Um, I mean, the other thing that I sort of really think about a lot now is one of the things I learned when I was little was that being in nature, just using that inverted commas there, mm -hmm. is not always, it doesn't have to be a comfortable experience. And I learned mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. yes, being out and about and playing outdoors is fun, but I ended up with thorns in my you know, mm -hmm. shins and feet a lot. Mm -hmm. I got bitten by a lot of mm -hmm. ants, but it kind of came with the territory. Yeah. It was also fun. It was also mm -hmm. you know, where I played. So I think that's one of the things that a mindset, mm -hmm. you know, the idea that it doesn't all have to be in service to us. It doesn't all have to feel... Yeah you know comfortable and good yeah. um that you kind of take take the rough with the smooth as it were mm. um i mean just to get a bit more practical because i know we've got mm. um people whose lives depend on livelihoods i should say all mm. our lives depend mm. on, <laughs> on being able to farm but livelihoods depend on this stuff um and sally and i just wanted to ask you i mean you know clearly dung beetles are getting a lot of attention and a lot of focus why do you think, well, dung beetles in particular, and, and how can they help farmers? So they've got, so dung beetles are a keystone species. And um, if you haven't got dung beetles in your pasture, you really have got a major problem. Mm -hmm. and, and the best way to illustrate how big a problem you've got is if we look at a case in Australia, where um, in Australia, Tasmania, New Zealand, you know, they, they suddenly, we suddenly brought in all these sheep and all these cattle because you had all this wonderful grassland or in all these animals to do some really serious livestock farming. And uh, the big problem started arising very, very quickly in the fact that pasture fouling started. And that's when the dung just stays on the surface and doesn't break down. And then if you've got dung everywhere, you've got a buildup of parasites because you've got certain parasites that go through the whole of the stomach system in the livestock, come out in the dung, go through a, a stage of their life cycle in the dung, migrate out in the grass, the animals eat them again. So if the dung sat there, then this parasite system can carry on and you get some pest flies. I'm always very cautious about saying the word pest. Mm -hmm. um, flies that yeah. aren't in, you know, these particular mm -hmm. flies may cause a problem that is economically detrimental yeah, to mm -hmm. the livestock and the humans. Mm -hmm. So they have a place in the um, ecosystem, but these, these flies were causing problems both for, for health of people and, and animals, uh, mainly for the animals. And, um, they realized that the dung wasn't being broken down and yet there were dung beetles all over these countries. So they've got dung beetles everywhere. So what was happening? And uh, it turns out that the dung beetles that are native to that Southern hemisphere area, mm. these, these dung beetles are specialist in animals that are native to the area as well. So they're feeding on dung from marsupials and the dung from the ovines and the bovines, the cattle and the sheep just wasn't suitable for them. Um, you know, these are small, small insects, and so slightly changes can have a big things. And the way those animals graze, the way it goes through their guts, the way it comes out is different food source, a different habitat. So they weren't going in it and they weren't using it, they weren't breaking it down. And so you had all this problem. Um, and they actually, Australia, the, they worked with the universities and the government, and they went out and they sourced other dung beetles from, from around the world, Mexico, Africa, places like that, that could deal with the temperature, deal with the soils, deal with that particular type of dung, everything, and brought them into Australia and got the whole system going again. 
Um, and if they hadn't have done that, then the question of the future of the cattle and the sheep industry outside would be would be questionable. I mean, is that serious? So, you know, that's how important they are. Um, and I see it in islands in particular, because um, insects have flight distances that they can disperse in. And islands are really exciting places to see systems collapse. <laughs> that sounds an awful <laughs> thing to say, but it's isolated. And if you take certain things out of that ecosystem um, and uh, it can easily collapse. And dung beetles are really important because their interaction with the biodiversity above and below ground makes them so special. Um, so if you're looking at pasture land, you want healthy animals. So you want these dung beetles here because they're helping break up parasite cycles. Uh, they carry little mites with them that also go in and look out, look out to eat fly eggs and fly maggots and things like that as well. So they're hitting parasites on, on two levels. Uh, they're breaking down that dung. They're allowing those animals to have a maximized grazing available to them. Uh, so that's all good for animal welfare and for their food and everything else as well. They're also, you know, they're taking all this, um, this nutrients from the dung into the soil. That's dispersing it to the plant root uptake for nutrients. It's also dispersing it to the soil invertebrates. So earthworms and calamboda, the springtails, all these different things are coming in. So lots of different things are coming in to eat the dung because of the dung beetles activity. Um, and that is bringing increasing your soil health. So it's increasing your partial land. It's increasing the where animals are able to put on more weight and, and lots of other things going on, health and everything else. So really, really important. And then alongside that, they are producing a food source for all the other things that are in the ecosystem mm -hmm. around the field. Um, so, you know, they, they are a keystone species and without them, the systems can come to a bit of a grinding halt. Uh, and, and that's the seriousness. You know, you take, if we took dung beetles out of this country, we would have a real serious problem um, mm -hmm. with our livestock, not just our livestock industry, but actually you'd have it beyond that. You'd have it with your wild animals as well. You know, dung needs to break down. Dung does break down without invertebrates, without dung beetles, mm -hmm. but it's a much, much slower process because you're relying on the weather and you're relying on the fungi and things like that. And it's just a much, much slower process. Mm -hmm. So, you know, th that's, it's, they're a part of a e whole ecosystem, an ecosystem within the dung pat, an ecosystem below the dung pat, and the wider ecosystem. That's the thing, you know, it, it's, it's focusing in on the little things um, mm. and then realizing that actually there's this is huge, huge environment that they actually support. Um, and then one thing that dung beetles do that's, that's really quite important and something we talk about a lot now is, is climate change. And we're looking at methane and the effect of, of these greenhouse gases and methane. And uh, if you have, dung on the ground that gets capped by the sun and the wind or just basically gets a natural crust mm. to it, um, it will continue to ferment and it will ferment mm. for a little while. And if you don't have the dung beetles in there, that fermenting process will carry on and it will be releasing methane. So having the dung beetles there is also, a, a, you know, combating in their own little way um, the release of methane from the livestock. Mm. So that's another, you know, real plus at the moment, definitely, well, all the time. But, you know, these things have been along all the way. We've got we've got coprites, dinosaur coprites, fossilized coprites mm -hmm. with with evidence of of dung beetle activity. Mm -hmm. um, we've just had a big dig quite locally. It was uh, on television with David Attenborough about some mammoths, step mammoths that were found mm -hmm. near Swindon. And uh, they have found dung beetles in situ with those mammoths and dung. So, you know, mm -hmm. these the dung beetles have been around happily piddling along behind mm -hmm. everybody else for a very, very <laughs> long time. Mm -hmm. um, and they are nature's recyclers. And recyclers are really, really important, whether they're in yeah. dead wood, whether they're in um, things like dung, you know, in our soils, everything, you know, recycling. We talk about now what's the biggest problem that humans have our inability to recycle a lot of the things we use. Therefore, we leave a, a real big problem, whereas recyclers are doing that job, they're recycling. So the recycling insects are really important, just as important as the pollinators and everything. They, all these things have mm. a need. And often yeah. within their life cycle, they are one thing and they might be another, depending mm. on what stage they're in in their life cycle as well. So it's, it's, yeah. it's a jigsaw. It, mm. it, you know, for me, life is a jigsaw and it's, it, mm. all these bits make the picture. And if you start losing a bit, you can never quite get that picture. So um, yeah, no, dung beetles are phenomenally important. I get very excited, sorry, you have to. <laughs> no, no. Um, you know, they, they are just fantastic. You, you, you pick up one of these beetles and they're, they're beautiful colors, lots of different colors on dung beetles. We don't know why. Why would something that lives underground or in the soil be colorful, iridescent, mm. you know, all these things. There's lots, there's so much we don't know. Yeah. We have funding to find out the effects of chemicals on dung beetles. Lots of, you know, yeah. 
written on this. I peer review and I've peer reviewed mm -hmm. loads of papers on this, but we are not finding out how far these things fly, how high mm -hmm. the species flies. You know, mm -hmm. they're exotherms, they're, they're insects. They don't necessarily like to be in cold spots. Some prefer cold, you know, they're, they're, they're specialists and generalists. Mm -hmm. When we talk about losing insects, what we're losing quicker than anything is a specialist because they've got less mm. ability to adapt. You know, they've, they've got a niche that somebody else hasn't mm. got and they've got in there and they're specialized specifically for this niche. And niches can be taking, you know, the tiniest little change to it can take a whole insect group out. But that mm. insect group is vitally important to all the others. With dung beetles, if you only have one species in your dung pack, you're not going to have the breakdown and the whole of these wonderful ecosystem services going on as you would if you had many different species because they emerge at different times and they they actually if you go into the dung pack i'm going to go really small now so you, you've got the planet you've got you know country you've got your field you've got your little area in the corner of the field we could go to different parts of the field because you'll get different insects within the mm. dung within different parts of the field because of temperature shade all these different things but if you go into the actual dung pack You've got a sort of the crusty bit here and you've got the interface between the soil and the, the dung at the bottom here. And you can have you can have dung beetles that specialize in just living in the bit between the soil and the dung. And you won't find them where the dung is falls on grass. They only like it where it's on bare soil. <laughs> so actually in the field, you want a little bit of bare soil. Um, and it's a bit like your garden, you know, yeah. you want your long grass because that's really good for a whole load of insects, mm. lots of moths that lay their eggs and larvae feed on long grass, all sorts of different things. But you also do want a little bit of short grass because your ashy mining bees and things like that want the short grass. Mm. So it's, it's that mosaic of habitats and your dung pack going really, really in there with mm. a microscope almost. Your dung pack is a micro habitat with all these different little habitats within it. Mm. And there's certain dung beetles that live all the way in this bit. There'll be dung beetles that live just under it. Some that go down a meter or so underneath it. Some that just want to live in the crusty bit when it's a little bit drier than the other bit. You know, all this sort of thing. So mm. having that mixture of dung beetles is important. So when we, we you know, it's, it's like butterflies or anything, you know, try and it's, it don't, we all have a passion for one particular species, I think. I, I don't know about you, Vicky, but, I, with dung beetles, I got very involved in one particular species, mm -hmm. mainly because I could pronounce its name. Um, that helps a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, and you, you, you do get this sort of, re, you know, relationship with them. Mm -hmm. But you begin, you know, you cannot be selfish to one species. You, know, you no. need all these species. And that's the mm -hmm. thing. And that's, you know, like Vicky's saying in a book, you know, we, we need all these insects. Uh, and even the ones that somebody might find unpleasant, it's got a, it's it's mm. there because it has a niche. It has a it has yeah. it's part of that jigsaw. Yeah. I have um of some a cellar here, quite a damp cellar, and in the cellar I have quite a rare species of slug, which I cannot remember the name of. Them. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's an age thing. Moment. Um, and mm. but this slug is actually quite rare, and it's rare because it likes to live in cellars and things like that. And nowadays we we warm our cellars up and we convert mm. them and we do this mm. with them. And we certainly don't want to tolerate slugs in them, you know that sort of yeah. thing. And so we've made this thing rare. And my children grew up knowing that the bottom toilet roll on the toilet roll holder belongs to the slugs. And that's what <laughs> we use. Um, and, and they're quite used to it. And they know that when they go downstairs at night, you turn the lights on so you don't stand on the slug as it's going down mm. the hallway. Yes, um, we've got that problem as well. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah. You know, this sort of thing. Yeah. And it, it's that sort of thing. It's, it, it's mm. how you, as an adult, put that across to them. You mm. know, to, to my, you know, yeah. Um, cellar beetles are becoming quite rare again mm. because we're warming our houses up we're putting central heating in we're changing their their mm. habitat and by cellar beetles whenever we find one we catch it and we we, we just tip x on its number and number 13 <laughs> has been running around my house for eight years now. wow uh, eight so, years you know, that's, that's amazing that is really unusual most insects yeah. have a much much shorter lifespan um, but these things are obviously able to live a bit longer. I've not, this is the oldest one. I haven't seen it this year. I'm no. say, and I don't know if one, number 13's number's up. But, you know, so, I think that's... But we've made in them. Oh, you know, so my attitude incredible. is they aren't mm. bad. And it's yeah. easy for me to get excited and get people excited and farmers excited and everything about mm. an insect that does them good. Um, both, but, you know, both mm. um, for the biology of their farm, but also for their, for their um, economic good. You know, they're a beneficial mm. insect. But also, you know, there are insects out there that we don't quite engage the same, but that comes down to your attitude. Mm. Um, and, you know, I find them all awesome. Yeah. And, and my attitude is they're awesome. You know, yeah. they're, they're, they're fabulous. Mm. You know, these amazing creatures. Don't mm. stop being that child that used to look at those mm. bugs. You stop yeah. 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 I think we've got like a, a lovely little window into yeah. 
the, the world and the home <laughs> of an entomologist. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's crazy. It's Sally my my yeah, son fantastic. shows cattle and my, I, my I mean, large I, um, uh, caterpillars got out and ate all his rosettes. So, oh. <laughs> you know, I get to <laughs> quite a lot. Yeah, too. well, I mean, I... I I never get rid of any of the spiders that I find, you know, if I've got a clean round them, I will, but I, you know, I, you know, yes, it's, it, some people find it weird, but I, I get that. Definitely get that. <laughs> um, I mean, thanks, Sally. And Vicky, I just wanted to kind of, you know, just to be a bit specific, I know we've covered a huge amount there with mm. the, the world of this keystone species. I love the fact that, you know, in some ways, what may have started with, I guess, you know, wolves in Yellowstone and kind of, mm that light bulb moment for a lot yeah. of people, which is this cascade effect. You bring mm. one species in and, and look at this cascade effect right down and up and yeah. down the food chain. Um, and it feels like, you know, we're sort of moving through different species from wolves to beavers. And, and now we're looking at mm. dung beetles in the same way, which I think is fantastic. Um, I just wanted to ask you, Vicky, in terms of, and I'm going to try and incorporate a question I've seen pop up from Joe Hope. It sounds like he's asked this question a few times and some, have not gotten into it. So I'm going to merge some questions and try and get your question in there as well, Joe. Um, it was really specifically like, you know, what should farmers be doing differently to ensure dung beetles can thrive? But specifically with what Joe is asking, which is a very specific and interesting um, issue he's got. Um, so he, Joe is an ecologist turned farmer establishing an agroforestry oh. system in mid wales using mm. native breed cattle um trying to wow. you know work with you know, boosting biodiversity and producing high quality food but has a problem with pheasants arriving mm. from a neighboring property and he's got huge hordes of these pheasants on his pasture um rarely sees a cow pat now because they're mostly shredded up what can he do so two questions hopefully rolled into one mm -hmm. which is a wider question what can farmers do differently but mm -hmm. and but maybe help joe out with his pheasants <laughs> yeah that's that's a, a, a lot of issues and a great subject yeah. um i the the thing about farming and i that's why i've worked on farming policy um and food policy for the last 30 years so unlike sally Ann, I, i'm not an expert i'm not an academic um as such but um the 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 problem I've seen over the 30 years, the systemic issues that are within the food system that mean that farmers have to farm in a particular way. Um, sometimes they go away a bit. Sometimes we get policies that help agri-environment schemes that help farmers do things differently from. But mostly the direction of travel of, of farm policy has been wrong. And it's partly driven by the desire for ever cheaper food and the food industry for selling us more processed food and ultra processed food and what I would call junk and all that direction travel is is bad for our health but it's also really bad for the bugs and I do talk about that in the in the book because I don't want didn't want the book to be about blaming farmers um, and I obviously didn't have time in the book to talk about all, all the very many things that farmers can do and are doing to help I've, I've covered a few you know great examples um, things you know having more habitat on the farm more edges to the farm um, like hedgerows, woodlands and trees, which provide an amazing corridor for the insects to travel through. Because one of the things we know is a problem for invertebrates is, is that fragmentation of the habitat. They might survive in a little area, but if they can't move and recolonize and find mates and nesting areas elsewhere, then that is a really problematic issue for, a, a, um, for an invertebrate to, in, in terms of thriving and uh, recolonizing and doing their stuff where they need to. So all the things farmers can do and using less chemicals, obvious one, organic farmers, there's great you know, body of evidence showing the benefits of that, um, using natural systems of pest control and natural systems of um, soil fertility building, um, rotations. Rotations is key for farmers, um, and they, they're they all beginning to realise that now. And, and also with the high cost of inputs and fertilisers and pe uh, pesticides that's, that's um, happening now, it's even more acute. So all those things that farmers can do, but they really need a supportive marketplace and supply chains. Um, and that is critical. That's something that we can all be part of as eaters. I don't say consumers, because sometimes consumers makes it into something which we have to be marketed at. Mm -hmm. And I think we're all eaters. We can eat good food, fresh food and, and uh, processing, whereas consumers is a, a different identity. So we can all play a part. And there's loads of tips in the book about that, what you, know, what you buy, what you cook, who you buy from, 
all that kind of stuff. Um, but in terms of the pheasants, I, I don't talk about that so much in the book in terms of game and the gaming industry. But personally, and this is my personal view, I think it's absolutely incredible that we're allowed to bring in loads of chicks, millions, um, you know, tens of millions of chicks into this country or rear them here. But we bring in, we import loads of chicks to rear and then release for shooting. And I don't want us to get into a big um, debate about shooting here, which I know is a, is a whole other subject. But I, I personally would say that's not sustainable. It's it's not sustainable for the bug populations, as as your um, Joe has found uh, on the farm, that they can really decimate bug populations. And there is evidence around that. There's possibly a role for some game uh, game activity in in some areas, but the volume is so high and you're introducing species into habitats, which just, you know, it just un balances the whole habitat as as you've seen i mean you know, one of the solutions i guess would be having fences and things like that which i i talk about in the book as being a bad thing you know fences and borders all these you know i talk about migration and the idea of calling people cockroaches when they're migrating into the uk all that's horrific and horrific use of invertebrates as a, a bad thing so sorry i'm going slightly off topic here but borders and and fences are, are not great for invertebrates but if you've if you've got a problem with this um, issue of um, uh, the uh, pheasants and shooting grouse shooting, I think the bigger issue is to, in an action is to try and get it reduced in in amounts and size and talk to your neighbours, talk to them about it. But it's a big budget industry. There's big money made on shoots and um, shooting, and so it's it's a whole it's a whole other topic. But uh, I. I I don't really have great answers. Maybe Sally Ann, um, as you're working so closely in the industry, you might have more. Um, but I think you know we've got to talk about what we're introducing into the environment, into the wild environment, you know, and that includes game birds and game chicks. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. So Joe, that sounds like you've got a, a bigger systemic problem on you, <laughs> other than just a neighbour with lots of pheasants. Yes. Um, Sally Ann, did, do you have any any advice on that? Well, I can, I can say that the fact that they're going out into the field and um, decimating the cow packs is actually, it's actually uh, reflects on Joe's um, habitat that he's got the food there for these pheasants yes. to go and do that. <laughs> um, they're, they're only doing it because they're finding food. And, um, and yes, that, that's not helping the whole of the, uh, the dung going through that particular dung beetle system. But if they're spreading the dung packs out and it's rainy, then that will push the nutrients in. Not quite the same, but it will do something. Um, but perhaps... Uh, I don't know what relationships are like between Joe mm -hmm. and his neighbour, yeah. um, but if they are if they are workable, then perhaps suggesting to the neighbour that they put pheasant feeders on their side of the border and fill them up. The birds have, will have a different target zone to go to um, than forage out in his fields. That might be one way forward. It's a difficult one. Um, mm, yeah. That that would have to be a, 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 a communication. Thing. But on the on the bright side, uh, the pheasants are there because Joe has got the beetles. Great habitat. Yeah. Well, so Joe, you're doing something right. Yeah. And for yeah. anyone who's not watching this from the UK, I just want to commend Sally Ann and Vicky for skirting around it. What is a political <laughs> hot potato? Yes, <laughs> and you've done really well. So we're going to move on. <laughs> um, so I was just looking through some of the other questions. Um, an interesting one here. I, I, if I'm, I apologize because I've lost track of who actually posed the question, um, but it was about sort of being counterintuitive and um, keeping your pest populations going mm -hmm. in order yeah. to keep your predator populations going. Yes. Yeah. Not what you would expect. I don't mm -hmm. know who wants to take that. Well, I could start, but um, I'm sure Sally has got good examples of that. But um, yeah, I mean, if you rely on lace wings and, and um, ladybirds to keep your aphid populations uh, down in your garden, but you're, you're, you know, you're using that as opposed to chemical controls for aphids, which is brilliant, and you've got the habitats for them, then you do still need to have aphids around for the uh, ladybirds and other bugs to feed on so it's a it's a natural system that's in a cycle and a boom and bust but you've got to put up with a bit of the um, pests to allow the um, invertebrates to continue their life cycle complex life cycles that they rely on so I think it's absolutely right you, you do need to put up with some level of pests and and one of the things about in terms of a larger farming system is having that monitoring and um, assessment 
system ongoing on your farm. So not just, you don't actually just spray or put the seeds in that have got the coating of pesticides. You're constantly assessing the level of um, pest load on the farm or disease load in the farm and applying controls as needed rather than doing them prophylactically. So on both situations, you will need to have a certain level of um, uh, pests to allow the pathogen, to allow the predators to feed and to continue their life cycle. So, you know, you need to put in the habitats for them, the hedgerows or the beetle banks or the scrubs or the wildflower patches to allow them to have somewhere to, to live, lay their eggs and et cetera. But you also need to have the food source for them. Mm. Yeah, Actually, that's just made me think about how that mindset, mm. um, you know, mm. conversation we were having right yeah. at the top, because Sally and mm. I noticed that you kind of remove trying to remove the word pest from the conversation mm. I slipped straight back into me too yes me too. <laughs> into type <laughs> but actually listening mm. to your answer though Vicky mm. what I was mm. thinking was well if we don't call them pests mm. and we don't call yeah. them predators and see something different yeah. Sally Ann what would that be I think that it's down to like Vicky was saying it's that monitoring thing you know mm. you need to to unless they have got an impact on you a detrimental impact economically within the farming you know situation um or gardening you know if you've got something mm. something eating your your vegetables and things you know basically if it's not got that economic impact then it is not a pest yes. it is part of a healthy ecosystem mm. um it, it becomes that pest if you like when it, it's actually impacting detrimentally on your on your output when your your crops and on your your mm. your economic viability mm. um and so it is about monitoring it's about mm. you know with farming going out there with your agronomist um lots of farmers don't go out and walk their fields with their with their agronomist you know if you mm. do make the time to do that and and talk to other farmers and get on social media and everything else and uh, monitor you know if you're if mm. you get insects recover very very quickly and mm. and very often they do need that they well they, they always need that prey but at different stages of say their, their life cycle mm. the larvae might be um something that's carnivorous and actually eating mm. other insects and things and the adult might be something that drinks pollen and, and eats nectar you know that sort of thing so it depends so you need them both on the farm um mm. and if you've got a threshold that's sort of getting a little bit high you can sometimes track it by your neighboring farmers as well yeah. in conversation. They might not necessarily want to admit to you that they've got a problem on the horizon, mm -hmm. um, but you know, working with your agronomist and everything else. And so you can preempt things as well. Um, mm -hmm. and, and as I say, a pest only becomes a pest when it is a pest. You know, prior to that, it's not a pest. Yeah. Um, if we have um, beetle banks, like uh, Vicky was saying, mm. field margins are very good, non spray headlands if you're in the conventional system, you know, all these sort of different things, mm. allowing you to have an area for a safe area for mm. all your vertebrates to go. You mm. are going to have to have some of your species that you don't really have on your wanted list in there because those other species it will be needing to feed to keep their life cycles going so if your other insects become a pest scenario mm. you've got the predators there to go and get them um mm. and that's that's you know that's all part of a healthy ecosystem it's when that that balance sort of does this and then it does that and mm. if you if you if you get rid of all of that you're going to affect this whole thing um mm -hmm. so it's keeping an e healthy ecosystem and monitoring that's the thing yeah. and, and just measuring whether your pest is a pest yeah funny Gillian I was chairing a session yesterday on pesticides and uh, the Patrick Barker who was one of the farmers uh, a fantastic example of uh, farming with nature and he said I go around out with a um, net and you know people probably think I'm a bit mad going around the net because like, he's passionate about invertebrates and particular bugs that he's managed to encourage on his farm but other farmers can go around with the net to actually assess bug populations that may become a problem yeah. so it's that monitoring enforcement or having equipment on the farm where you can track uh, aphid levels um, and that doesn't have to be hugely expensive equipment but it should be you know i think government should be supporting farmers in getting the knowledge back mm. on being able to assess and monitor mm. um populations of invertebrates that could be bringing in disease or could be a problem and and stopping them at the threshold economic threshold but i love the idea of patrick with his is a uh, net and farmers could be doing more of that and yeah. actually finding more more out about what's around on the farm as well i think that's very important because i i get people say to me well you know you're excited about a bug but really you know you tell me not to to you tell me to maintain these margins and things for for these insects that are going to go out there and they're going to make a difference on my farm because they they're, they're going to kill some of my you know these other species and 
and that I should be doing more to, to encourage these beneficial insects. But at the end of the day, you're talking about something that's this tiny. Is it really going to have that big an effect on me? And I, I always turn around and say, well, you're growing oil seed rape or you're trying to grow oil seed rape. But you've got a major problem with a tiny bug mm. called a seed beetle. And it's just tiny. Mm. Yeah? Mm. And so it's getting them, you know, it's that sort of thing. It's it's mm. it's you know um so things like so, uh, parasitic wasps are are awesome creatures in your arsenal of fighters on the farm you know these these insects yeah, are brilliant amazing and mm. if you want to see those at play and you live in a city or you live anywhere where there's no big green area just buy yourself a pot and grow one nasturtium in it or yeah. one yes. brussel sprout plant or something mm -hmm. and just watch your large whites and any of your white butterflies come and lay their eggs on watch the caterpillars going through all their different stages watch other things come and pick them off you know and you see them mm -hmm. being part of an ecosystem within your your tiny one pot and then watch those caterpillars when they start to get a little bit larger and they leave the plant and they perhaps go a little way up the wall of your house and then they stop and then you'll watch them just sit there for a little while, a bit longer, a bit longer. You think, well, it hasn't turned into a, a pupa. It's mm. not going through a chrysalis. You know, it's still there, this caterpillar. And then all of a sudden you'll start seeing these little white sort of little cocoons being pushed out through its skin. And, and all these little wasps come out. And that's really cool. Yeah, um, you know, absolutely. And, and that's what a parasitic wasp does. They get in there and they attack from the inside mm -hmm. out. And from that one caterpillar, you've got a whole host of them going off to do the same again. Mm -hmm. You know, these tiny, tiny, wee things yeah, are so important. Mm -hmm. So it, we've, we've talked about, you know, the kind of insect, insect interactions, predator, prey, you know, press, pest, predator, whatever the terminology we want to use. Um, there is obviously, you know, other moving parts in the okay. system. And one very important one mm -hmm. is the plants, flowering plants, which have almost sort of, you know, one, mm -hmm. one side, of, you know, the other side of the same coin when you talk mm -hmm. about insects and flowering plants. Mm -hmm. um, and Sally Ann, you mentioned, you know, you've got to have a safe area mm -hmm. for invertebrates to go. So I'm just sort of looking through and I'm going to try and, you know, address a number of different questions um, you know, together and here, because there's been one question um, asking about how small scale growers can, should they be dedicating a proportion of their land for wildflowers, um, you know, cover crops to encourage insects and invertebrates, but also more specifically a question from Jane Arnold asking about any tips for re-establishing flowering plants in very established hedgerows? So again, this is quite a UK sort of picture, uh, but hedgerows where cow parsley and nettles are really dominant. So I guess it's sort of, you know, a broad question about, uh, I think I'd also made a note of a third question that, oh no, that, yeah, I've covered it. But it's, it's really about, you know, how do you support this recovery, if you like, rebugging um, with what plants and safe areas are available for these invertebrates? Vicky, do you want to, start on that one um yeah no it's uh, absolutely critical um I, I love the bug um life beelines project they've got this project where everybody can get involved in providing that bit of corridor that bit of habitat that bit of flowering um verge a margin of a, a road that it will be a critical um corridor for um invertebrates to travel through it's it's b as in capital b I don't it doesn't just mean bees it's all of all of the you know invertebrates that can move distances and you know doing that you could be part of a really big movement for change um and if you don't want to actually buy um uh flowering plants or seeds um just letting it rewild itself I I've let large parts of my garden rewild and I've got loads of flowers in there as a result um uh, my brain's gone blank again in terms of the flowers but there's loads of them small often small little little flowers um and they just are, you know humming with invertebrates when in the summer but they've just come naturally they've they've arrived and they're native plants as well that's a good thing to try and focus on getting native plants and not um plants that have uh what are they called multiple um petals if they've got you know they're sometimes bred. You see a lot of flowering plants bred mm -hmm. and sold that have got uh, more than one set of petals in them. It sounds, I can't remember the actual term, maybe one of you know it, but they're very much harder for uh, the invertebrates to get the nectar in uh, and, and get inside. They're not bred for invertebrates to use, they're bred for how they look. So try and mm -hmm. go for plants that are native um, or naturally occurring or just rewild. And, and if you can encourage your local council or local authorities to rewild um, grass verges 
and um, roundabouts and in the parks, in part of the parks, obviously people use parks to walk in and things like that, but they can always rewild some of the park. And people like that. They can see what that means and what that does in terms of the noise and buzz and it's good for the birds and other invertebrates people like to hear and see. So get involved with your council or, or your local friends of the park group to create those corridors and habitats and refuges. And it's amazing, as Sally Ann says, they, they can bounce back they can arrive without you knowing where the hell they came from. And they're amazing, um, you know, and not, and not just flowering, they come through the soil, through the grassy verges, they can crawl and they can come um, underneath us without us knowing. So anything you can do to have a more diverse and dare I say it, messy environment in your garden or in your road or in your park or in your school grounds, schools are great places or in even I talk about your workplace, you know, you can have some, that pot that Sally Ann talked about, you can have a few pots in your workplace and make all the difference, just providing that that mm -hmm. um, stopping place for an invertebrate flying through, it needs to stop, it needs to feed or it needs to rest and then carry on. It's amazing what difference that can make. So yeah, fantastic. And please, yeah. double flowered, somebody's put it in the uh, uh, chat, double flower varieties. And they're often difficult for invertebrates to get, if they've been overbred, they're difficult for the invertebrates to get the nectar from. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Joe. Actually, yeah, so Vicky, that's interesting because there was a question um, in, in the Q&A about um, someone with an urban garden in London, how can you yeah. encourage, or oh, she, I don't know, um, yeah, encourage more mm. bugs in the garden. And I guess, mm. you know, what you were talking about there, which is actually mm. looking beyond your garden mm. to um, parks and, you know, yeah. verges and all that stuff, that will presumably also help. It'll help you, more. yeah. I've, I've yeah. got a very messy garden, and I'm, but I'm surrounded slightly. I mean, no disrespect to my neighbours, but and I'm in London, tiny urban garden, surrounded by decking and concrete. Um, mm. So I don't get as much as I would expect. I do get amazing things, and I've photographed them and talked to people about what you can get. I get amazing things, but I'd probably get more if more of my neighbours were doing a little bit more, you know, and providing those um, messy bits and uh, uh, flowering um border and things like that if I had more of those I'd get more and they'd get more you know it's it's a multiplier effect if you're all providing that corridor and that's that uh, uh breaking up those um, fragmented habitats you know you're actually providing the corridor between them is really crucial mm. yeah so and obviously using as minimal chemicals as you can preferably mm. none is another yeah. tool for, for the person asking the question. You know, if, you know, if you've got a more diverse farm, uh, farm or more diverse garden, you're gonna have less of a, of a big problem with any particular pest. Mm -hmm. Excellent, so that also answers um, Marion Hill's question, uh, maybe not directly, but you know, in terms of the impact that garden pesticides and weed killers have on insect mm -hmm. numbers of domestic gardens. Um, Marion, that's that's the that's the verdict. If you can use none, preferably, yes, <laughs> um, yeah. then that's great. Um, Sally and there are biological I'm... controls. Sorry, just to finish yeah. off about, you can buy mm -hmm. um, nematodes for slug control and and snail control. You get them in in a, a powder form, and when you put them in water, they uh, eventually um, hatch out, and they can infect the slugs to lower to a level. You know that you can cope with and, and things like that and obviously if if you've got hedgerows hedgehogs anywhere you don't want to use any um slug pellets or anything like that so using natural controls and obviously another natural control will be birds and frogs and toads get a pond in your garden yeah excellent sorry I kind of, well, no, I love the idea, particularly for people. I mean, I, I live in a small town. Um, I don't even have a garden. It's just sort of a small kind of, you know, court. I don't, I call it a courtyard. It's probably only the size of about three square meters. But, oh. you know, the idea of trying to join up these very fragmented habitats, um, there's some, yeah. for me, there's a kind of a maybe, mm slightly you know rosy <laughs> rosy <laughs> but I like the idea that it it does encourage the you know mm. maybe that sort of connecting with your neighbors um yeah. more of a yeah. community yeah. feel where people mm. you know this join up especially in the you know the age that we live in where um that sort of face-to-face -face contact we're experiencing it even here um on on the conference it's great to be able to do it virtually it's great we've got it it's a shame we have to is, is what I would say um but similarly you know using using your urban garden trying to connect with your neighborhood you know build a kind of more of a community um these are great tools to foster that kind of spirit mm. i suppose yeah, if, um, absolutely 
if people can. Sally Ann, when before we started the session, we were, you know, got carried away chatting, and you'd mentioned how many of the plant species that are good for invertebrates are considered arable weeds. And I just wondered if you wanted to speak on that a bit. Yeah, so basically, you know, one of the, the plant groups that are, that are really struggling um, with, with um, well, becoming a rare group are the arable weeds, you know, the plants that actually grow within the crop because um, we don't, you know, we, we, we do um, basically farm in a way that doesn't allow these weeds to, to be there because hence the name weeds, you know, that's the thing, a plant that's in a place you don't want it to be is a weed. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's, it's that sort of thing. And uh, at the end of the day, like just exactly what Vicky was saying, and, and to reiterate that, you know, it's, you want native plants for our native insects because they have different feeding patterns and various other things, but they also, something like our bees, they have different length tongues. Um, so if you grow uh, one particular flower for one, you know, for all your insects, I've grown this, this one particular flower, not everything can feed from it. Um, and that's that's the thing that diversity so within the crops it's, it's having a bit of messiness in the crop as well um, and that's really quite hard you know because you can have your grain at the end of the day has to then go through a cleaner it has to go through this it has to be that it could be rejected because it's got too much seed or something else in it. it's not supposed to be there and all this sort of thing so you know alongside the farming side of it but it's about having those margins you've got your your hedgerow you have your grassy margin and, it, and if you get things growing that you get things growing up you get ragwort growing in it now you know ragwort's one of those yellow flag plants <laughs> literally throws up a yellow flag and and the whole of the equine community now are, are shouting you know rip it up and and you know because the plant has this toxicity however it supports 51 i think it's about 51 species of invertebrates this one plant alone um and uh, so if it does come up in the hedgerows leave it you know, if it's not going to be made into hay, if it's not going to go into a horse paddock and things like that, then then leave it because that's a native plant supporting a phenomenal bout of, of insects. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you're in a non if you're in a conventional farm and uh, you are using chemicals, then you don't spray that area between the um, hedgerow, the margin and the next tram line or the first tram line. Um, and that allows those insects to be there. But it also means that's not just for pesticides, that's for herbicides as well. And to let these plants sort of come back too, because the insects need the plants and the plants need the insects. So mm. it's, it's about that, you know, it is, it is really hard because the, 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 uh, you know, the, when you're, when you're producing a large crop for, for human consumption and things, you know, you've got these, these parameters on, you've got to have a, a clean crop, you've got to have this, you've got to have that, you know, it's just the same as, as if we go into a supermarket, People want to pick up a yellow, perfectly shaped banana. They want to pick up a perfect red apple with no, you know, holes in it or anything like that. You know, we, we as a as a supermarket demands what they've got to have. The consumer wants cheap food, and the farmer's got to produce this perfect product at, at minimal cost. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's about having that little bit of messiness um, on the farm as well, and and being you know do it as much as you yeah. can. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you can have these arable weeds sort of supported, we, we lost so many of them, the mm -hmm. corn crockle, you know, the, even the field pansy, all these sort of things mm -hmm. um, have, have disappeared. And there's a whole load of arable weeds that are, are very rare now. Um, mm -hmm. And with them go certain specialist insects. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, it's, it's just having that bit of messiness. Um, yeah, and, and, that, and that extends again, trees, trees are awesome. Lots of insects in trees, brilliant. Leave a large tree in your, your hedgerow, marvelous. That's great, that's there for nest birds and that's there for raptor points and all these different things. And when it dies, it's awesome. Don't yeah. be tempted to chop it up and put it in your wood burner. Um, you know, I know that there's that it's there and it's wood and everything else, but there's actually a more insects probably on a dead standing tree than there is on a live standing tree. Um, so, you know, something as simple as leaving things like that produces a habitat. Um, and uh, but no, going back to the weeds, it is literally a case of, you know, just being a little bit messier on the farm, but it's where you can allow that to happen. And in on every corner, of the fields and if you've got a wet corner or something like that then yes you can put it into your schemes and, and there's very same schemes you can do and access and you can plant it with lots of different things or you could just leave it to actually repopulate because what will grow there is in is the seed bank that's mm. prop, is correct for that soil yeah. for that spot 
and everything else. Mm -hmm. So if you allow those things to come through, you're going to allow the insects that are also correct for that area and spot and everything else. And, and the system kicks in. And that's where you will get these little pockets of these arable weeds coming in as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's that sort of thing. It's it's being it's farming with nature. Um, it's something that we've all got to do, no matter what our farming system is, whether we're a big industrial farm, whether we're a small holding, whether we're someone who's got an allotment, um, we all need to sort of grow our food with, with nature in mind. And um, weeds are very much like pest species. They're, you know, in, in mm. insects, they are just a, a plant or an insect that's just in the mm. wrong place at the wrong time in many respects. Yeah. So, yeah, a bit of messiness. Messiness. Well, it's going to change tack a little bit now because um, it's a huge amount of information. I know we're literally skimming the surface of a lot of things. There's no, you know, the time is just flying by. Um, I guess for me, one of the, some of the questions I'm seeing coming up, I felt it was a case of, you know, at this stage, you know, that message of, you know, whether you've got a, you know, a few pots on a balcony, or you've got an urban garden, an allotment, a small holding, you're a big farmer. Um, across the board, we got to be working with nature. It's, you know, we really don't have a choice in my view. Mm. Um, and it's the next step for that for me is, you know, well, how do we empower people mm. to do that? Because, yeah, well, the very first part of it is knowing what you're looking at. I mean, one of the things that it's taken me a long time to unpick what was going on in my head. <laughs> I won't go too much into that detail, but what I mean by that is I grew up in Kenya and moved to the UK sort of in my teens. And in my teens, I didn't really have that sort of connection with nature. I lost, I spent most of my time listening to music, headphones on, doing what most mm -hmm. teenagers do. And it was only really in my adult life that I sort of started doing biology and then sort of, you know, got back into you know, biology and wildlife and nature. But by that point, I think I'd lost the fluency around being able to identify or at least understand what I was looking at. So I'll give you a good example of, or the example that I sort of really, that really helped me to understand what do, what does it take to empower people to become good field people? So they know what they're looking at. Yeah. And the difference for me was when I'm in Kenya, I can stand back and look at any number of plants and I can tell you what, you know, what the leaves feel like, what they'll smell like if I crush them mm. in between my hands without ever going near that plant because I've had so much experience around it just from playing mm. and growing up around it in that environment. But I don't know what they're called because I never learned the names of things. Whereas here, I know lots of names of things, but if you ask me about hazel leaf, I have to pause just that little bit, like I'm reaching into a second language to conjure up an image of a, the outline of a hazel leaf. And that's usually from a field guide rather than a lived experience that I'm mm. sort of you know, drawing on. So I've sort of, I use that example a lot because it's a real challenge of, you know, we talked about mindsets. We're now talking about how to empower people to actually go out and know what they're looking at. What tips do you have? I mean, there have been questions about how do we monitor bug numbers? How, you know, can we have help with ID? What, Vicky, what is your top tip in terms of, becoming yeah. a better field person yeah that's really good it's a it's a um it's a wonderful uh image i've got of you knowing you know <laughs> being so much outside and and being so at one that you know know all the bugs and the plants and everything um i i've talked in the book a bit about um spreading the word because i think everybody probably on this um session could be ambassadors for the bugs uh, it sounds like everybody wanted to you know amazing ambassadors and so talking about it and talking about it with with people that you wouldn't normally talk about it um you know with your family maybe you are um, enthusing that, them about nature but maybe in another setting in church or in um in another workplace or when you go to a parish council meeting or you know for others when they're in school and one of the things I found really useful for that is actually using my smartphone which has its environmental impacts certainly and we need to be careful about that but the photographs you can take with a smartphone now are so amazing and you can take it from a distance so you don't disturb the bug because they obviously they move very quickly and it's hard to get but then you can zoom in and you can see just how incredible it is but also sharing that in on Instagram or TikTok or all those you know different 
And I found that amazing over the last two years, just during lockdown, being able to share the photographs of what I found in my tiny garden. And I've put it all on a, um, a website. Um, and when you actually see how incredible, yeah, there's, a, there's a fantastic hoverfly, which I, I don't think I've seen before in my garden. And it just looks so amazing. I'd love to have a dress made in that pattern you know it's just like so beautiful but it's also spreading the word about you know how beautiful they are but also you can talk about how important they are if you know you know you've learned how they hoverflies are amazing pest control they're you know can be uh eating other bugs but also they pollinators as well etc cetera, etc cetera. so you can start talking to people but also show them something because visual things often stay with it's like smell stays with people the most but visuals stay with people an awful lot and the few talks i've done um on the book i've shared those photographs i was doing one in hay and it was really great i didn't have any words on the slides i just had the pictures from my tiny 10 by 10 garden and it's quite powerful because then people can go and say, oh, I haven't really realised how much is there. I must look closer, but then also spread the word. So I think I think and, and also there is a, a big body of um, scientists who are working on the um, on a global level, talking about they've done a, a massive meta study of all the studies of insect and invertebrate decline. And one of their main recommendations that comes out in the abstract, you know, the summary is that they need public support. They need the public awareness in order to deliver the policies and the research um, uh, money, funding and support to do the kind of research they need to do, which isn't about how we can stop bugs eating a lot of crops, but doing the research that Sally was talking about, about their lifestyles, about how they need what they need, how things are changing, the trends. And that kind of research takes money and they need public support for bugs to get that money freed up, to get public parliamentarians to understand so on and so forth it's all tied up but actually i think photographs is is great to um uh think about a way to communicate with children etc so mm -hmm. i did i've got a little box in there called smartphone insect joy and just what you can do with your um phone is quite amazing now and you can instantly share it with whoever you know on your whatsapp group or your instagram and get the i record app and oh get, yes yeah get Absolutely. those photos and get get them into iRecord because the um they they get separated out into all the specialists who deal in the different groups and that data with a photograph and and the information um is really really important citizen science and and does go into to helping us chart where these insects are and how well they're doing yeah absolutely That's and if awesome. you can't identify the field studies council and other people have put other um and nhbs have got um id um, guides to identify yeah. sorry field yeah. studies council got those lovely ones which are laminated you know they don't cover yeah. all the insects there's a mm. phenomenal amount of insects we yeah. haven't even categorized all the insects yeah. in this country yet you know there's loads yeah. but you can do the majority that you're going to recognize and you certainly get your eye in like you're saying for a group oh that's a hoverfly that's a bee you know that you know just get those things separated out first of all um but they do that they do those laminated ones don't they so you can just take them down anywhere with you they can leave them in the truck you can take them down to your allotments you can you know and they just wipe clean them and they're fine they're brilliant 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 things i think that's field studies council isn't it that does those ones um but yeah get, get them on i record take those photographs get them on i record and mm -hmm. and there's a good twitter community and facebook community there's lots of facebook groups you can join as well mm, yeah. um that specialize with people just wanting to id photographs and things admittedly you do get someone says oh it's this and then somebody else says that and that and that but on the whole you know you'll get that quicker answer yeah actually just while just while you've mentioned that sally Ann, i'm just gonna um just mention to georgie georgia who is um, one of the volunteers who's sitting quietly muted off the if um george could you find the i record or link to the i record <laughs> app just to put in the chat for all the audience and also massive shout out to georgia because she's actually in australia believe it or not <laughs> there's 2 a.m there and she's volunteering for this so it's amazing um so we've got 15 minutes left to start kind of pulling things together i sort of feel like i know where where i'd love to direct the conversation but I just wanted to give both of you a chance um Sally Ann Vicky um you know just to kind of if there's anything that you feel we haven't touched on I just wanted to make sure we leave time for that um anything that you really you know a burning issue that you want to talk about that we haven't touched on Sally Ann do you want to do you want to start well, I think one of the things for me is um, from my own experience. So here I, I am restoring calcareous grassland on the farm here. And I've just taken on grassland from my neighboring, um, which is actually National Trust land um, and forming a corridor 
Uh, and it's all based around a dung beetle. Um, and it's a very, very uh, rare dung beetle in this area. And it's it's one of the specialists. It's, it's very sensitive to lots of things, nitrogen, you know, um, to improve pasture with artificial fertilizers. Um, it really likes native breeds, um, dung, and uh, it's, it's got all sorts of different little, very specific things that it requires. And we're farming around this particular dung beetle, which is not the normal way of farming and not the normal way of going around it. And it's only because of my passion and my, my interest and my research, this is happening. And the one thing that's come out of the whole thing is I've been running this project for so long that what I wanted to run alongside it was profitability. Um, because we don't often do that in our research. We say, oh, this is how you should manage something for the wildlife. And we just overlook whether that's actually viable to do in a way. I need to be able to pay for my rent. I need to be able to pay my bills. I need to be able to pay all sorts of different things. Um, and so that was one thing I was doing. And, and one thing I've found over the time is that it actually is quite hard to farm in a way that's perfect for these insects um, and still be a profitable farm in this respect, because it's very low income, it, because it's a very low stocking density, it's, it's all sorts of different things. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm, use, I'm using native breeze. And the one way that I can continue this work and keep going is having that market that is fair. Mm. So, you know, I do, if you, you, I know we are in Veganuary at the moment, so it's probably not the best time to, to bring that up, but, you know, buy locally, support people like, like that are doing the meat boxes and things like that, because they, they've normally got animals that just won't stand up financially um, viably in the mainstream marketplace. Um, and these animals are native and they're, they're grazing in a way that's really supportive of an environment. And in that environment, you'll have all that biodiversity and you'll have those, those insects there. Um, because if you, if you farm sustainably and, and in a way that is very sort of conscious of the environment around you, you're already increasing insects tenfold and you probably don't even realize. Um, so, you know, that's that's one thing that I wanted to get across was, you know, support the systems that are doing this because it's actually quite hard. There isn't that much support for systems like mine. And that's that's really sad because that's, you know, this is a large scale. I'm, I've got 400 acres here of Kakaras mm. grassland. It's rarer than rainforest. Um, it's a really, really special habitat. And it supports insects that are rare because the, the habitat mm. is rare. Um, and we've got chalk hill blues and all sorts of wonderful things uh, feeding on the plants that are coming back because of the system and the way it's run. But I need to have that end product market. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where we've, we've all got to really think about how we buy food and how we support farms like that um, mm -hmm. to get this system in. It, it is, you know, yes, it is that public goods for, for you know, public things, mm -hmm. but it, it's supporting that system. Um, so, yeah, and, and generally, you know, seasonal buy, locally by all the rest of it you are more likely to be supporting a farming system in place that is doing far more to our for our environmental gain really and and wherever you're doing that you've definitely got insects as soon as you as soon as you're farming mm -hmm. sustainably and and sympathetically towards the environment you will have insects ex going for it and exploiting that that area definitely a fair market actually i like that because um I often say, you know, there's the be kind, um, mm -hmm. you know, sort of hashtag. Well, I, I, I like saying be fair because, you know, you can mm -hmm. be kind but and not be fair, but be fair. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's definitely I mean, it's, that, lots that you can do. Exactly. Yeah. There's lots you can do. And Vicky will say something else. But from a farming point of view, mm -hmm. that's that's very much it. You know, if, if a farmer is, is mm -hmm. doing this type of work, they're invariably doing it with animals that just aren't the real big commercial animals. Mm -hmm. um, they've got their, you know, my sheep normally produce single lambs, you know, this sort of thing. They're not having twins, triplets, quads, you know. So your returns are much, much lower. And mm -hmm. it's supporting a system that is that is sympathetic to the environment. 100%. Vicky, how about you? Is there anything that you feel, you know, you, you'd you like to kind of bring up um, just as we're starting to move towards the end of the session? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a fantastic example of why we should be eating less and better meat and really supporting those kind of things and having the market, uh, supporting farmers in finding those marketplaces. That takes time. A lot of farmers aren't marketeers they're selling to commodities so we need to get a transition and support or supportive food traders there's a better food traders network which should be able to provide that better link between consumers or eaters and and farmers like sally doing wonderful things i was years ago i was on a panel called eat the view and it was run by the countryside commission which is now um natural england and it was a great idea somebody's mentioned a, a um uh, a beef in in the chat uh, about Gower Meadow beef. That's mm -hmm. you're eating the view. 
you're supporting the view by buying from those producers. That's a great example, but it, it's too small and it's too niche at the moment and often too expensive. What we need is that available for everybody, um, but everybody eating less and better and uh, not going for the factory farm meat. But the thing that I did want to say, um, particularly, I guess, is that pol political side of things, because the power of, of the food industry to direct policies in the in the wrong direction has been witnessed i've witnessed for the last 30 years in in my campaigning years and they have a huge amount of power huge amount of lobby and money to lobby um everywhere i mean this the numbers of the amount that billions spent on lobbying particularly in america lobbying for um lowering um controls on chemicals allowing chemicals that we know to be harmful to humans as well as uh, nature and wildlife you know they, they, they incredible power so the only thing that can counter that power is a democratic process but also a movement of people so it, you know if people can join campaigns um, at a local level or national campaigns there's a load of um uh in there's a long list at the end of my book of ones you you can join and really support what they're doing um or start your own campaign locally with a local newspaper or a local radio to get a local park um to get uh, more rewilding in the local park or less chemicals used on the local verges you know they, and there's a lot of support out there a lot of organizations can give you the tools to do the kind of campaigning or you can just support them in what they're doing because that, without that movement without that people power we won't be able to counter the power of the the food industry and i'm not saying everybody in the food industry is evil that's that's rubbish you know they're, they're all great people doing their good things but as a whole the direction of travel has been so much in the wrong direction it's it's like a huge mammoth a huge tanker to change direction and that tanker change in that direction um will take a huge movement and a massive push on politicians to do the right thing and in the uk we have an opportunity now because we have new farm scheme um paying pub public money for public goods, as Sally was saying. Um, it's it's a long way off perfect at the moment, but it needs the pressure from people and farmers and um, farm workers to get it going in the right direction. So join with local organizations, wildlife trusts and others who are trying to make it work so that it does provide good income for farmers. And I think there also needs to be additional support for the infrastructure and um, supply chains and logistics um, so that means investment by government or private investment or impact investors if any of anybody on this is a millionaire and wants to be an impact investor they could really support agroecological supply chains and like packing rooms or hubs and all these kind of things because that will support the farmers that are doing things right for the bugs and that that's you know it's these complex systems that we've set going in the wrong direction we need to change that tanker turn that tank around to go in the right direction it, it'll take a lot but i think you know that involves people and um joint people joining together either within organizations or personally joining together to do things so get political with a small p i'm not talking about any party in particular but get political and get active um politically so you can they they feel the heat of your love for the bugs if i can say it um you know so they can hear from you you write letters go to their surgeries go to mp surgeries and all that kind of thing um it will make a difference and it does make a difference and that's what scientists as i've said in the note uh are calling for they want that public support for what they want to do as well so um yeah get political <laughs> that's great well we've got just under well, just over five minutes, and I'm determined to land this baby. <laughs> at You're doing think, a great job, actually, Julian. That I think great. Georgia goes by everybody. <laughs> um, I, I mean, thank you so much to to both of you for you know sharing that knowledge. I think what you were just finishing up there, with Vicky, is something that I've definitely started to feel quite strongly. I love um, the fact that we can connect you know globally with you know hundreds of people in a session like this um across the whole conference as well the real farming conference um it, it's great that we can do that and there's definitely you know benefits to that but i you know very much you know a believer now that on top of all of that on top of all the virtual connections we can make on social media platforms and in virtual conferences that one of the most radical acts we can do right now is actually just going and talking to people face to face mm. having those conversations yeah. it sort of pushes back on those algorithms that start to funnel yeah. us down some very yeah. 
very narrow tracks, if you like. Um, and I guess, yeah. you know, with just a few minutes left, sally Ann, is there, you know, where would you like to see what kind of, you know, I'm just trying to imagine what would your ideal picture of where we are, say, in 20, 2030, you know, what would you like, what, you, what do you hope will have happened by then, sally Ann? Well, I would like to see more bugs on our windscreens by 2030, <laughs> yeah. definitely. Yeah. Mm. Um, you know, they, these things, mm. these insects are robust. Um, they, they have many strategies in their life cycles to enable them to be survivors. Um, but we need to enable them to have that ability to have, you know, able mm. to survive, basically. You know, we need to give them these habitats and these environments mm. back in safe ways. Mm. Um, so it, it's basically, yeah, I would, our insects can come back. This is this is not we are not all going down the tunnel of no return. We can mm. turn the tide. Yeah. Um, and little things make huge differences for little mm. things. Mm. Um, you know, they are little things. They 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 can survive in tremendous situations in, in, with very little. So, you know, it, it, it doesn't take much to to enable them to come mm. back in the numbers. Um, and, and we've got to remember where they are in, in the food chain. They're down the bottom, which yeah. means there's an awful lot above them that mm. relies on them. Yeah. And, and we're up there too. So, yeah. you know, it's really important that we, we turn the tide. And it, as I say, I think it can be done because look, you know, we're talking about it today. Um, we're getting more and more conversations about it, but it's not just conversations. We're getting practical things happening at ground level. Uh, and that's very important. I'm certainly not going to stop my work anytime soon, con connecting directly with farmers at ground level and making tiny changes mm -hmm. because those tiny changes expand and, and we, we get those things back. Um, it's collective thinking. You know, we can all do our bit um, and you can all, you know, you can, anyone, even if you live on the 10th floor flat and you've got a windowsill, you can put a tiny tray of water out on a hot day and you'll be amazed how many insects will come in for a drink. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just little things keeping that joined up world going. Mm -hmm. We share our world. Yeah. It's not our world. We share yeah. it. Um, yeah, it's absolutely. their world and we're on yeah. it. Um, you know, so yeah, let's let's see more bugs on the windscreen in, in yes. 30 years' time. It can be done. So they, they bounce back and bounce back fast. Vicky, how about yeah. you? Yeah. It, it, brilliant. Yeah, yeah, in a way that's I do have a chapter in the in the end of the book, which is imagining if we have rebugged everything. And there's more noise, uh, there's more on the windscreen, there's there's uh, more colour because we've got more flowers and more greenery around, um, and there's different foods and we're eating differently and interesting in the session I was um, talking at before this one was around fairness in the dairy supply chain and a woman who's a fantastic advocate for, for dairy um, was talking about in 30 years time she can imagine farms would be more calf at foot and uh, it's really more animal welfare friendly systems which have so the fewer um, but better systems, fewer animals, better systems and, and supporting um, much more wildlife in those systems. So having, I, I, you know, that, that kind of change in the farming system would be wonderful in the next 30 years. So we, and also, I mean, somebody talked earlier and asked about small farms. Small farms are brilliant for bugs because they've got smaller fields. They've got more edges and more habitats and stuff like that. So I'd like to see more farms, <laughs> it sounds odd. Yeah. You know, farms have just got bigger and bigger and the hedgerows have gone as a result, things have been grubbed up. They've got bigger, more intensive, all we've exported overseas. So I'd like to see more farms here, more young people in farming and understanding the role of bugs in their farming system and really embracing integrated pest management and all that kind of thing. And being supported by us as eaters, eating their produce more directly or through better food traders. You know, I, I don't want, I shouldn't really say it, but you know, a real squeeze on Tesco, you know, so it's just a tiny, tiny company would be amazing, unlikely, but those kind of things, I, I think diversity for me is the key and, and diversity in our retail, diversity in farming, diversity in our diets. And that would all be more colour, more noise, more sound, more smells, and it would be wonderful. <laughs> I am loving this vision of 2030. Let's make it happen. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Thank you, everyone who's joined. Thank you, Sally Ann and Vicky, and Thank of course, you. Georgia, our volunteer. Um, have a great rest of the conference, everyone, and goodbye.